Hello. So as a management engineer, you're probably asking yourself, well, when in the world do I really need to worry about this issue of, of risk? I mean, life, loss of life, it, you know, am I ever going to be working on anything um, that's like that? Um, I, you know, you don't see yourself as doing medical devices and other software that has life critical features to it. And I agree, you're probably not going to work on a medical device. Um, but there are lots of other things where there's a real potential for uh, other losses. Um, they, thankfully, they're not dealing with loss of life, but there certainly are potential for other losses uh, and they need to be considered. And, and just to give you some examples so that you can see the spectrum a little bit better, um, so they're not so dramatic as the loss of life ones. But think about it, let's say you were to, to work on a system uh, like Waterloo Works. So you're all familiar with Waterloo Works for getting your co-op uh, placements and so forth. Now, and co-op is very important to you. So what is, if you think about it from your perspective, don't think of, don't worry about the university's perspective. You're a user of the system. What goes on in that system and what sort of, uh, if you could imagine, potential risks would exist with it? Um, I can think of all sorts of them. Uh, if I was applying for a job with Waterloo Works, I would definitely think one of the risks would be, um, actually the first one would be, well, for whatever reason, it's got a bug in it and it never showed me that job at Tesla that would have been a perfect fit for me. I don't know why, but there was something in my profile and there was a bug and I never saw the posting. So I never could apply for the job. Um, so that's, a, that's a, certainly a flaw caused by a bug. And what's the loss? Well, this is sort of this loss of opportunity. You know, it's really awful. Uh, think about other sorts of things where uh, employers rank applicants and then there's this matching portion of the system. What if the matching portion uh, has a flaw? And let's actually say it's a, let's, what if it has a fundamental flaw in the way that it operates? Um, because, you know, there is the potential uh, that with, you know, students receiving multiple matches and things, maybe the algorithm uh, doesn't fairly make decisions about who goes to which company and so forth and so on. It's possible. I don't know the details of the algorithm, but I could see that that happening there. Um, you know, what if, you know, your application to a job never actually gets seen by the employer because again of a design flaw or a bug. So these, you can see, wow, there are these potential, this is, there are important functions here. And if, if there, there was uh, problems, it, it would be with vulnerabilities and then you just simply in using it, uh, you know, triggered them, that would be bad. Likewise, you could, you could see someone, uh, let's say there was a, a nefarious student, we wouldn't have one ever, but just imagine someone who purposely found a way to manipulate it so that uh, other applicants, or they could eliminate, let's say, other applicants. They were actually able to break into the system. So they are the ones who are able to look like the best and get the job and so forth and so on. I mean, that sort of thing, you know, it seems a little far-fetched, but uh, we certainly wouldn't want it to happen. Uh, and likewise, like with all information systems, there is the potential even just for what happens if uh, there is a, let's say a power outage and in the midst of it, something happens to the hardware and we lose all that data because there wasn't a backup. Employers, in the students, everyone has to go to all this trouble. So there's a real loss. So there's all sorts of things. And the designers of Waterloo Works have to have looked at all of these things and thought about them and, and looked at ways to potentially mitigate them. All right. Um, now that's, so that's, 
That Waterloo works gives that feeling of just a regular information system and there's some very standard things that if there are problems, yeah, we're going to, to lose out. But the, I, I think it's something you definitely would think about. Now, even more likely for a management engineer, uh, and I have this as the required reading in a small little one and a half page write-up about this situation. Um, in uh, science, so this is a high quality journal in 2019, uh, Ober Meyer or Mayer et al. They wrote a uh, article where they reported uh, that software, and it's widely used by uh, hospitals by a company called Optum. Now that to me sounds like a company that would hire some good management engineers doing operations research, you know, optimal or so Optum. Um, and, and it was, they had software um, uh, uh, so Optum designed it, the software to identify patients. So you're already a patient, um, but there is a special type of care called high risk care management. And so with high risk care management, the idea is that you've got a lot of health complications and issues and overall it could be more costly for the hospital and health organization to, to not give you specialized treatment and care. Um, so in other words, let me, I was probably saying that wrong. Words. So all patients need health care, all right. But some of them have uh, sets of conditions and things that require special attention. In the hospital, it's, it's expensive to give the special attention. And the idea would be, we only want to give the special attention to patients that really need it. And when we do that, actually overall healthcare costs decrease because you know we've targeted the care there. We help those people, which prevents further escalation of health problems. Um, but if we do those special, uh, the high risk care management, and again, this, this means assigning all sorts of nurses and doctors, a lot of, a lot of really special care to people who don't need it. That's certainly a, a waste of resources. And so again, this is a, a complete, you know, the absolutely you can see uh, so that management engineer would be involved in this. It involves taking patient records, uh, all sorts of data and behind the scenes, there is a algorithm that runs that then gives us risk, what's called a risk score to each patient. Uh, and so the problem was, and so when the risk score, the higher the risk score, the more likely that you should be considered to be put into this special care management system. Now, the, the problem was as follows. Okay, so the, the basic thing is the algorithm produces a risk score. And the higher uh, the risk score, again, more likely you're gonna be identified for this treatment. And, um, but the problem goes as follows. Um, so at the same risk score, so, so you have two patients and they both get the same risk score. So the algorithm says they're both at the same, uh, basically they're both equally unhealthy. They're both equally suitable at this level for consideration for the risk management program. Uh, not the risk management program, sorry. The, it's called a high risk care management program. And uh, so at the same risk score, uh, black patients uh, 
are sicker than white patients. So, uh, the problem ends up being is thus black patients get less care. And the real thing here, well, how do, what do we describe this besides being awful is that, you know, the algorithm has racial bias in it. So it's biased against black people. Um, and we would never think that this would happen, um, but it does. And now, so just to be clear again, two patients, same score, in general, unfortunately, at that same score, we're going to find that patients who are black are actually sicker than the patients who are white. Thus, when we make our decisions about who to give uh, this special care to, it tends to favor going to white patients as opposed to black patients, who actually the black patients need, are more likely to need the care than the white patients. Um, so let alone from, I mean, ethically it's horrible, but uh, from a optimization standpoint, it's failing. Uh, and so how, how could this really be? Um, what, what did the, what did the, uh, the makers of the algorithm do that was wrong? Well, there's a good analysis of it in the articles, um, but the key thing being, now it is important to note, so the, Optum, the company who did this, provided the algorithm to the researchers, um, were completely open and transparent, and really then took the findings and are they're working to change their, their algorithm. So uh, they're, they're not in denial about the problem, and then they really wanted to do the right thing. And they, that went into the original design of their algorithm as well, which was they carefully made sure not to include racial information into the inputs that they were going to use to make their predictions. So what happened? Well, um, there are all sorts of factors that were fed into the algorithm and the system uh, still unfortunately uh, in, in, what it, in what I think the biggest thing was is in what they tried to optimize the goal uh, unfortunately, the, the optimization per, you know, goal led then to the actual uh, giving of lower scores to the black patients because uh, of, you know, it's difficult. I, I have to go back to the article again and find out. But nevertheless, it's not able to, it, it fundamentally was flawed. Now, so it's flawed, but they didn't catch the mistake. And so what this really tells us when, um, and the important lesson here from a risk management standpoint is that algor, algor, oh, it's so hard. I'm, it's in the morning, I'm having trouble speaking. So algor, algorithm, I'm just gonna say algorithm behavior uh, must be checked for biases. Based. So if you're working with people, you need to look at based on gender, race, age, etc. Okay. Um, and this is really uh, is telling us this is all about the quality of the algorithm. How does it actually behave? And these are complex uh, algorithms. They could be involving machine learning, uh, all sorts of things. Um, so it's a quality algorithm. It's not about finding bugs. So I was talking with Waterloo Works. Oh, there'd probably be a bug here, a bug here. Someone is able to get in and break in. No, this is a carefully designed algorithm 
It's been thoroughly uh, evaluated. It's bug free, but the algorithm itself has a design flaw in it. And so this is a design flaw type of issue. Um, so it's not about finding bugs, although you certainly wouldn't want them. Um, but it really gets at how we evaluate our software. So I think these are the situations that management engineers, uh, you're going to find yourself in a lot. So we've got quite a few uh, alumni who work uh, with hospitals and in healthcare situations, and they're doing exactly this sort of thing. Uh, so they, they need to be concerned about, well, have I somehow put biases into my, my algorithm? Um, I wasn't going to talk about it in depth, but you know, one of the things, you know, it's easy to find lots of this stuff on, on the web, lots of reports of these things. For example, uh, people studied facial recognition software and they were able to find, uh, this is only a couple of years ago, they were able to find that uh, there were 34% higher error rates for darker skinned females than lighter skinned males. So facial recognition, the software as sold, uh, would make more mistakes for uh, dark skinned women than for light skinned males. Well, what's the downside? Well, it's, it's treating, it's got a bias in it based upon race and gender. And if you employ facial recognition, um, so even if it's for something that's convenient, like let's say logging onto your computer, the uh, segment of the population is going to have more problems with it than another segment. Um, and that's, that's not right and that's not proper to be having constant issues. But likewise as well, you could see it being used in all sorts of, uh, you know, we won't get into the ethical issues of it, but the but law enforcement. And so you could have misidentification of darker skinned women more often than men. And so people being investigated or brought in uh, for situations where they shouldn't be. Uh, that doesn't, that's not a good thing. Um, but where, where else do we see these, this sort of uh, algorithmic bias? Well, a really big place is when you do web search. So my, my research uh, area is what's called information retrieval. And in information retrieval, we study a whole wide range of things, but one of the big things being uh, search engines. So how to build them, um, make them help people find the information faster and better. Um, so where, let's give you an example here. So this is health search. And this is a project that I, uh, that the idea originally originated with uh, actually a uh, former management engineering student, Francis Pokakar, uh, also had a graduate student, Amira Ganai, and they uh, worked on this problem. And Francis is now uh, uh, working on her master's at the University of Toronto. And the, the issue was this. So you go health search. Uh, so this is on a web search engine like Google. And let's say, you know, you want to investigate a treatment for a particular health issue. Um, and what we were able to show in this study was that uh, bias in the search results affects people's decision accuracy. And so the issue here really is that there's a whole mix of correct and incorrect information out there on the web. And to a lot of search engines, it all looks as looks the same. It looks just as good for you. It, you know, let's say we take a really simple example of, oh, I have lower back pain. And uh, I was wondering, you know, if I put insoles into my shoes, maybe that would help my back. So you go to the search engine and you type, you know, uh, insoles for lower back pain. And you're going to get back a whole set of results. And some of them are going to be from manufacturers about uh, insoles. And they're good. Buy our insoles. They'll help you with your low back pain. But you might also find uh, 
a newspaper article or a, a scientific article that actually shows that they have studied this and there is no known benefit to using insoles for your back pain. Now, to a search engine, all those documents look good. That's why they return them to you. They think they'll go, you're going to find them useful. Now, to a user as well, oh, that looks useful. It says it's good for me. Oh, this looks useful. It says it doesn't work. Well, what are, what's the user to do when they see this? Well, if it's biased towards the ones that say the insoles are good for you, what we found is that people would go, yeah, I think the answer is I should buy the insoles. If it's biased in the direction towards actually the correct information, which they're not good for you, people would be, oh, the search engine is telling me that they're not good for me. So let's say now you are an actual engineer and you're working on the search engine. What should you be doing? Well, it would seem that if, if people, when they use it, are influenced by the search results, you would have a responsibility to provide them search results that would hopefully lead them to a better uh, decision, uh, to be more often correct in their decision making to something where they don't waste their money or they don't, oh, hopefully it's not a more serious thing than low back pain where they start treating themselves with quack treatments, okay? And so it's a real tricky problem in search, um, not only how do you do the right thing, but how do you measure what the search engine is doing so that you can actually improve its quality over time? Um, and so this is one of those things where it's not about bugs. It's not about hackers getting in and doing stuff. Um, but we can see that the nature of these complex algorithms that are running, they have potential for biases in them uh, or, you know, a bias the issue is one of the biases here is that search engines tend to like to tell you health treatments always work. They find the documents that say health treatments work, but they don't always work. Insoles don't help your lower back pain. So if they're biased towards telling you that, whenever you're researching something that's not good for you, there's going to be, it's going to be biased in the wrong direction. And that's potentially going to lead to inaccurate decisions on your part. So. I think the point I'm trying to get at is it's where we're going to see a lot of things from management engineering are doing very exciting, uh, neat machine learning and other sort of applications. And uh, the issue is, is that it comes, becomes very important to evaluate what's going on and is it treating people fairly? Is it leading them to make correct decisions? We have a whole sort of higher level of actually determining what the risks are and then actually checking our work to see whether it's, those risks are, 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 are being mitigated against. It's actually way more complex than the simple examples of, oh, I want to prevent loss of life. Those are, those are sort of, there might not be simple engineering problems, but they're, they're sort of clear cut. Yeah, we've got to have redundancy. We got to do that. And so all those things are super important. But now we're down to the design and functioning of complex algorithms. Um, the, especially all the machine learning. This is where we're seeing tons of issues of bias. I gave you the facial recognition example. You know, they, or there, there's all sorts of cases like uh, all your assistants like Alexa and Siri. Well, they tend to like accents that are more like mine rather than other people. Well, they're the fundamental flaw. You know, what? why is that? A lot of it has to do with bias in the training data that the engineers use. Um, and to the engineers, all the training data seems good. The training data is like them because the engineers are not a diverse set of people, unfortunately. Um, and then their, their products that they make reflect that. So engineers really need to be thinking about sort of these, these, these issues uh, much more seriously. Um, I think I had one more example. Oh yeah, and you're like, well, I think the thing is, I think students also think, well, 
I'll only have to worry about this once I get out, maybe for a job. Well, um, I had a uh, one year we had an FYDP project, a fourth year design project, um, and it was uh, location recommendations. And the idea of this was that we would that the students were going to get a bunch of census data and what the idea would be something along the lines of helping people uh, find new locations uh, you know scout out in a city or something uh, a place to either buy a home or uh, a place of business or something along those lines and so one of the ideas uh, certainly was, uh, well, why don't we like, you know, we could ask people about, let's say, past places that they've lived. Uh, they could tell us which ones they liked, which ones they didn't like. And then based upon that, we could look for similar locations. Anyways, what's the harm in that? Well, we need to remember and keep in mind, especially uh, in uh, places like the United States that's had a history of racial segregation, that Physical locations tend to be segregated by race and class. Uh, there's all sorts of things along those lines. And so when you design an algorithm like this, are you actually going to uh, reinforce the existing segregation so, uh, that exists? So even if you're gonna base it off upon characteristics of income and other sorts of things you could end up being like oh we recommend that you live over here well wait a minute is are those recommendations biasing and pushing people to continue the segregation or are they somehow able to be blind to that um certainly if you did it you know uh you could come up with ways that you know it was just like you know on you know if it's just house price. Well, these are the houses and the ranges that you want. Well, that's not a very useful recommendation system, but it's probably not biased, okay? Um, other than rich people could only live in the super expensive homes and, the, and so forth and so on. Um, but the moment you start taking in a whole range of factors, before you know it, you have things correlated with stuff that you weren't anticipating. And it's the same problem that happened with that Optum algorithm um, you know and so uh, even if you exclude oh the census data about race it doesn't mean that your algorithm will not be biased in that fashion and you and you certainly need to pay attention to it another FYDP uh, thing you may have seen this this is the engineering quiz so it asks you all sorts of questions uh, about engineering and uh, it, there's actually been many variations of this it started as a MSI uh, 446 uh, a machine learning data mining project and it's since been done by uh, other teams and most recently a fourth year design project and basically uh, one of the things there is we know that uh, unfortunately across the engineering programs that there is a uh, some programs have higher percentages of women in them than other programs. Again, if we're going to ask people questions and then provide them a recommendation for a certain uh, engineering field that fits them well, we need to be careful that the questions that we ask them and the, the algorithm does not end up make, making recommendations that further reinforce those existing biases. Um, and again, the thing is, those algorithms work by collecting data from the existing populations of the student bodies, and those student bodies are biased. So care needs to be taken towards actually making or testing that our recommendations are, do not continue to propagate uh, a bias in them. So there's lots of problems that we're going to see uh, that are really applicable to the software systems that management engineers make where you do need to think about all the risks that are at hand 
and then start to come up with a, a, a way to mitigate them.